Hello, hello. Um, okay, um, hello and welcome everyone. I'm Alexis Urieta. I'm uh, working in UNCTACT, uh, one of the co-organizers of this um, long project of uh, two years. I'm going to be uh, quickly going through um, what is this project about in in just a, a few slides I, and then i'll give over to the speakers um so to start with um, this um, um i hope you are seeing this right now this is um, a project that was um uh, financed with the help of um, new york uh, united nations new york that was called the development account and it was um, supposed to force us to address the urgencies that uh, emerged with the COVID um, shock. And as a matter of fact, and then we um, gathered the, the best experts out there um, from uh, Francis Cripps, Terry McKinley, Alemay Ojeda, Pranav, Muko Payai, and um, and uh, so we, we tried to address these um, COVID shock from both the perspective of the world as a whole using the global policy model and then further some uh, country specific analysis in Africa and um, with it also the environmental aspects um, that were addressed by um, our colleague Pranav from the University of um, uh, Goa in India. And uh, so we created the website which is indicated here in this slide. Um, and uh, in, inside this website, you will find all the materials that we were producing already from last year. This is a paper produced um, last year by Terry with the help of uh, Francis Scripps. Um, and here is a technical note that explains the paper. We have uh, two papers produced already last year on Ethiopia, on Zambia, and we have a paper, a global paper on climate adaptation produced by Pranap Mukopayai. And um, unfortunately, I couldn't find this paper this morning. We found that it disappeared from the specific website of the project. I'm using another um, site where you can retrieve the paper, but his paper will be restored in the, in the project itself. So today we are presenting the latest of the latest work uh, being done with a global policy model and um, which we assess the policy challenges for the mid and long term. Um, uh, uh, that will be presented by Professor Jerry McKinley from SOAS and, and Terry uh, will be going through the slides. I'm going to help him with that. But at the same time, uh, um, Francis Cripps who was uh, behind this amazing amount of work of trying to estimate global trajectory for not only the usual 20 countries plus 10 groups that cover the entire world, because normally we work in this environment of 30 uh, countries and groups in total, but um, expanded it to various other countries in the South, in the global South, and we have reached to a level of 35 individual countries, which was an heroic effort, and, uh, and then 10 um, regional groups that covered the rest of the world. Now, this um, paper, I must warn you before, um, it was um, finalized, both the paper and the underlying modeling uh, work, it was finalized early February before the conflict in Ukraine broke. So it will not be specifically addressing any of that. And besides, it's focused on the long-term trajectories beyond the short term. Um, now, I must, before giving the, 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 the floor to, to Terry, I must uh, stress the importance of um, uh, Francis Cripps in having done all this work over the many years, because he was the main author behind the creation of the global policy model back in 2007. And um, before that, he was uh, conducting through the University of Cambridge in the 80s, um, a, a global economic modeling effort that stayed over the many years and was used um, not only by um, uh, some colleagues in the University of Cambridge, 
and uh, other organizations and think tanks like um, Alphametrics, Applica in Brussels. Um, but it was also um, uh, disseminated through another new, um, new uh, incarnation of this model. Uh, again, um, where Francis was the, the principal um, creator, um, this new incarnation took the form of an academic version of the global policy model. So without that, mm, practically little of what we're going to discuss today would be possible. So thanks very much to Francis Cripps. Now I'm now giving the floor to um, to Terry, uh, Terry McKinley, a professor of uh, the University of London SOAS. And um, I'm going to be <clears throat> plugging in his slides as soon as he shows his face and starts speaking. Okay. All right. Can you see me? Yeah. I can hear you. Oh, no. Don't seem to see you. Um, no. Okay, but um, you will send us a photo. We will start with the paper then. <clears throat> okay, so here we have the, the front slide. Okay, all right, you can hear me, huh? Yeah, yeah we can yes, hear you. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> okay, all right. So I think Alex gave a lot of the background to, to this uh, presentation, which is based on, on the paper and France's really key contributions to it. It's projecting a, a global development trajectory uh, until 2030. That's the main, main focus of it. And the next slide. Uh... I'm, I'm on it. Okay, sorry. Yep. Okay, so again, Alex has explained the model of the global policy model, and, and it's been used in this case to do a global scenario of world trade and finance, roughly from 2019 to 2030. Its focus really is on the COVID period, what we labeled the COVID period, 2020 to 2025, and post-COVID trends for 2026, 2030. And uh, Alex has also already explained that 15 developed economies have been added to the original list of 19 countries. So we're really looking at 34 individual country results that we can focus on and, 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 and analyze. And uh, what I'm going to be focusing on is nine world regions. So the two developed regions of Europe and North America, Russia and Central Asia, China, East Asia and the Pacific, North Africa and the Middle East, Central and South America, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Africa south of the Sahara. You can see that there's really three Asian regions, the China, East Asia, and the Pacific, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. And also, given time, you know, highlight a few country results. Okay, next. Oh, sorry, I went too fast. Oh. Yeah. What, what we've done is we focused on six economic variables, and I'm listing them here before we go into the details. Real GDP, percent growth per annum, the level of GDP per capita in 2015 purchasing power parity terms, and then a second set of government deficits as a percent of GDP and government debt percent of GDP. And the last pair, the current account is a percentage of GDP and the international investment position, which is a positive value denotes a, a net creditor country and a negative value denotes a net debtor country. So that's the background of the material I'll be covering. All right. Real, G, real GDP growth, I tried, I'll tried. i just highlight a few Examples, obviously there's too much detail to go over in this short presentation, but you'll see that uh, if you look at uh, 2011 to 2019, original period, historical period, then you have what we call, call the, the COVID related period, 2020 starting and going through 2025. And then we're looking to see if there's some kind of recovery by 2026 to 2030. And you can see that you know, the North America and Europe, the, the two developed 
economies, uh, two developed regions, you know, do basically come back to where they were in one form or another or approximate in 2026, 2030, after slipping in, in 2020 to 2025. But this isn't necessarily the case for a number of the other developing regions. You can see China, East Asia, and the Pacific, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, North Africa and the Middle East, Africa south of the Sahara, even in Africa south of the Sahara, you see a projection of zero growth in 2026, 2030. North Africa and the Middle East, you know, almost zero, 0.5 percent. And this is not related to the, the events in Ukraine. Eurasia and Central Asia was projected to have a, a negative 1.9 percent growth of real GDP for the period 2026, 2030, based on our analysis. We move to the next slide. Sorry, I was shocked with your figures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somewhat shocking. Uh, okay, so country examples. I mean, these, I'll just quickly go over because we don't really have the time to get into individual countries that much. But you can see uh, Iran, for example, you know, negative 3% growth projected for 2026, 2030, after having some positive growth in 2020, 25. Uh, North Africa, not doing well at all, you know, in terms of 1.5% growth. Africa, mm -hmm. south of the Sahara has dropped off, originally had 5.5%. Now it's projected to have only 2.8% in 2026, 30. Nigeria being a, a good example, you know, of what, what would happen there. Uh, Bangladesh, you know, down to 1.0% growth when it had 6.7% 2011, 2019. And then you have Vietnam is the one exception that really has quite robust growth throughout the three periods, all the way through the projected period of 2026, 2030. So next slide. GDP per capita, again, back to the regions, you'll see Sub-Saharan Africa is not going to be doing very well based on the projections, dropping off by about 16 percent between 2019 and 2030. In contrast, you look at the Asian regions, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and down a little bit, China, East Asia, and the Pacific, you're, they're gaining in terms of the increase in their GDP, the level of their GDP per capita. 26%, 18%, and China, East Asia, and the Pacific, 55%, the highest change. But if you look at Russia, again, without any re reference to current conditions, Russia and Central Asia is projected to have a negative 4% growth, uh, decline, excuse me, decline in GDP mm. per capita. Europe, the two developed regions seem to be doing decently well. I mean, Europe, 18% increase. North America, 13% increase. But we'll have to look more closely at some of these, these results later on to see what's happening. Next. Country examples. You can see Russia's dropping off there. 26,000 down to 24,200. Nigeria is collapsing practically. It's quite dramatic, the decrease. India, on the other hand, is increasing quite robustly, 6,900 up to 9,200. If you go down a little bit, you'll see Japan and Germany are doing very well indeed, 42,000 roughly up to 51,500 for Japan, Germany, 49,800 up to 56,200. Even the USA is still going to be increasing, but not as robustly. Next slide. Okay, on to government deficits. This is sort of the second part of the, the paper related to government debt as well. At the global level, you can see the 2020, 2025 period, that's the related to COVID and the rest. There's a drop off obviously almost across the board and quite significant in some countries, some regions. So, for example, at the global level, you have a negative 5.6% decline, 2020-25, and then some recovery back to negative 3.4%, which is where it was roughly in 2011-2019. South Asia, 
is going to have a, 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 a decent, uh, quite a dramatic decline in uh, 2020, 2025, but it comes back to roughly the, the deficit that it had in 2011, 2019. Look at North America, though. There's a, it's still quite high. If you look at just the the column on 2026 to 2030, you see that North America is not doing going to be doing that well at all in 2026, 2030. Russia and Central Asia also is going to be in the same league in terms of a decline, in terms of the the deficits, the widening of the deficits. Excuse me. China, East Asia, and the Pacific, there are some problems there, negative 3.8% projected in terms of the size of the deficits, the average deficits. Sub-Saharan Africa, obviously 3.0%. But look at Europe at the very bottom there, for example. Europe is only going to have a deficit, government deficit of about 1% of GDP in 2026, 2030. So especially compared to North America, which is 4.4% negative, it's uh, doing quite, quite uh, better comparatively. And that seems to carry over a, a, across a number of the indicators. Next slide. Some examples, you see reduced deficits. And you know, when you compare 2026, the supposed recovery period to 2011, 2019, USA goes from a negative 6.5% back down to negative 4.9% deficit. Brazil I, I, is a little bit unbelievable. It, it, it reduces its deficit down to a negative 0.5%. And France does quite well as well, down to negative 0.2% by that projected period. You see Kenya is another example, uh, Bangladesh, so on. Increased deficits, though, Republic of Korea, which overall does fairly well across the various indicators, is going to widen its deficit, government deficit up, up to over negative 3%. And Southeast Asia, Australia, see Turkey in, de, increases its deficit quite dramatically to a negative 5.1%. Next one. Okay, on to government debt related obviously to government deficits. You look at the world, there's a there's a overall increase of government debt across the board from about 75% in 2019, up to 90% in the supposed COVID related period and all the way up to 96% in 2030. But who is really leading these increases? You look at North America, Canada, US, so forth. They're increasing significantly up to 119% in 2030. The other Central and South America you can see as well is quite high up 122% from a start of 72% in 2019, a very dramatic increase. And you can see the others, China, East Asia, and the Pacific is going to have some problems, 95%. South Asia as well, India and the rest, 105%. Okay, if you look at Europe and compare it to the other countries, again, Europe is, is an outlier in many ways. It basically holds its own on the level of government debt. If you look from 78% in 2019 to 2030, it's still only about 80% after coming back down a little bit. But Sub-Saharan Africa, obviously not going to be doing well, almost, almost a doubling up to 93% government debt as a ratio to GDP. Same kind of doubling in Southeast Asia, North Africa and the Middle East, almost a doubling. Russia and Central Asia upped again to 47%, another kind of rough doubling of the situation in terms of the debt level. Next slide. Again, some just quick references to individual countries. You see Brazil is quite dramatic in terms of going from 88%, already fairly high, to, to 140% of GDP in terms of the debt level. Yeah, Colombia is even worse. USA, which I like to focus on, is it keeps going up up to 121% from an already high level of 108%. India 
joins the club of 100% more when it goes from its debt goes from 74% of GDP to 109%. Moderate or low increases, China is an example. It does go up, its debt does go up, but it's only up to 78%. South Africa up to 80%. Uganda, you have an example there around 50%, same with Iran. Bangladesh, keeping it fairly low, quite, quite extraordinary. And Germany, again, another country to look at, is basically maintaining its, its own in terms of its level of debt, which is quite, quite extraordinary. Okay, next slide. Okay, the last two issues of current account and the international investment position. Current account, you see that Europe, again, is doing, going to be doing quite well, if you believe the projections that we're coming up with it that the current account is gonna be a positive 3.8% of GDP by 2026, 2030, starting out from already 1.5% during the period 2011, 2019. China also is gonna be positive, right? Although it drops off a bit from the two earlier periods down to 1.1%. If you're looking for the worst case cases, look at Russia and Central Asia down to a negative two, 0.4% from a positive value of 1.7% in 2011, 2019. You got South Asia, fair, the red is for fairly high levels in 2026, 2030. So South Asia is gonna have a relatively high level, negative 2.7%. And then you have North America, by com direct comparison, co compare it to Europe again. Europe is a positive 3.8%. North America is going to be a negative 3.1%. And it's going to be close to conditions in sub-Saharan Africa where it's a negative 3.2%. So these are quite, quite challenging kind of changes going on. Next slide. Some examples, Germany is doing incredibly well. Current account projected to be, right? 10.4% of GDP during the period 2026 to 2030. Japan also doing quite well, 8.7% surplus. Republic of Korea growing very, fairly rapidly and ha having a current account very large, 7.1%. Uh, the moderate levels you can see in the middle there, you know, not to focus on too much there, but you can see some countries are basically holding their own, but significant current account deficits, Canada, for example, Egypt, Uganda, Bangladesh, Indonesia. So just some examples, quick examples. Okay, next slide. The last, last topic then, international investment position. Again, a positive value means that country, uh, that region, excuse me, that region is a net creditor. A negative value means it's a net debtor. You can see East Asia and Pacific pretty much holds its own across the three periods, you know, and by 2026, 2030, it has a positive 37% of GDP as, as its international investment position. Very close to it again, Europe doing very well, uh, positive net credit position, 36% of GDP for Europe. Russia and Central Asia started out with a positive value go, goes up a bit, and now it's starting to come down a bit, down to 19%. And then even North Africa and the Middle East, the oil exporters, I imagine, positive 12% of GDP. The worst positions you can see at the bottom, the three bottom regions, South Asia basically is, could suffer because it has a negative 32% of GDP, a net debtor position. Sub-Saharan Africa, not surprising, a net debtor position of a negative 48% of GDP. And North America, again, highlight is con contrast with Europe, which is a net creditor region. North America is a negative 67% of GDP, the highest net debtor position. I think that's about it. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, one more slide of just a few examples. Japan, net creditor, quite dramatic, 112% of GDP. Germany, again, in, in Europe, 
147% of GDP, Republic of Korea doing relatively well. China, just nominally a net creditor region, a country, excuse me, 3% of GDP. Major net debtors, again, not surprisingly, USA, negative 74%, Mexico, UK, negative 63%. And you have up even worse situations in some Latin American countries like Colombia, negative 107%. Egypt, not doing well. Congo, Democratic, Democratic Republic, not doing well either. And Uganda. That's about it. It was fast, I know, but hmm. short time. Well, thank you um, very much, Terry. Uh, I, I assume there are going to be very punchy questions to this presentation after we <laughs> open for questions and answers because your your results are 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 striking indeed. Um, but for a moment, um, I, I think uh, we should leave it at that. And shall we go for? Um, I can't remember who was next in the list. Was it Pranav there? Yeah, Pranav. Okay, Pranav, if you, if you don't mind. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Alex. Um, and uh, nice to see lots of familiar faces, uh, Francis and Terry. Thanks for that presentation. Uh, after yours, uh, mine will be more like a back to the future or back to the past kind of stuff. Um, I will share my screen at this stage and uh, to take it from there. Right, so um, what I will, I have worked on um, in this as part of this project is to look at the impact that uh, you know climate adaptation will um, push onto um, countries which are already struggling with developmental challenges, and one of the ways that this could probably be achieved is to uh, potentially uh, undertake. Uh, structural transformation. So uh, COVID happened while this project was on or this project was on during the COVID period. And um, it is like an extreme event in certain ways. And therefore it, make, it made perfect sense to ask the question that um, does, you know, what are the kind of disasters that we have experienced uh, that are recorded in the databases of extreme events? And we find that floods, um, and associated with that landslides, storms, uh, heat waves, droughts and wildfires occupy a fairly prominent place. Uh, those are in terms of frequency. If you look at in terms of the number of people affected, floods and droughts occupy a large landscape in terms of the disasters. The top 10 countries are many of the countries that uh, are part of the uh, this studies uh, group of countries they include China, the US, India, Philippines, Indonesia, all of these except Afghanistan are part of the group that um, form part of our study. So very quickly, because it's the post-COVID uh, uh, dissemination exercise, uh, I looked at what it implies in terms of, uh, I'm gonna try and get rid of this bottom panel if I can. Give me a second. Okay, there we go. So here what we did is we looked at uh, the current status in terms of the total number of tests done per million and uh, logged it against the HDI 2020 and the GDP per capita and purchasing power, uh, parity. And it looked like a one-to-one -one correlation, literally, that if you, are, if you have higher incomes, higher developmental uh, indicators, you would have been doing a lot more tests than everybody else. So that's expected. Um, if you look at the number of if you look at the number of deaths, that too looks pretty similar. And it would be surprising because you would think that these are countries that have very high, uh, you know, public health access, and therefore the chances of people dying of COVID would be much lower. But probably the you know the the issue here is that the countries that had poor testing also had very little information on what people were dying of. 
So that's that's a potential hypothesis. It is not something that I've tested, but I just looked at the data while I was preparing to make this presentation. So what are the countries we have covered in our study? Very similar to what uh, Terry was talking about. It's a group of 30 countries. Uh, I used a classification of uh, the World Bank, which classifies them into four high income countries, upper middle income, lower middle income, and low income. Uh, the study had a the sample from each of these groups, the low income only had Ethiopia and Tanzania, unfortunately, but um, you know, uh, that's, that's the way the set went. Um, what did we do? We looked at a transition analysis. We compared the outcomes that countries had experienced between 1978 and 2018. That gave us four decades of uh, you know, analytical space. And we used a notional uh, you know, divider that you have an aspirational per capita income. And what was that? That was what the US had achieved in 1978. And in terms of purchasing power parity of 2015, that looked like $30,600 approximately. And all monetary values are normalized at 2015 prices, US PPP. So um, we further asked the question that does geography determine you know, your future and where you uh, end up going? It's a certain sense of southernness that is used in all kinds of sociological uh, discussions. And uh, so, so we started off by asking, how far are you from the equator? And obviously some countries are much bigger than the others and uh, lie both, you know, in both zones of the tropics and the temperate zones. But we use the uh, capital, location of the capital as a decider for the country's location. And the blue line that you see in the middle of these two graphs is the uh, per capita income of the US, which is the aspirational income, presumably of many countries who want to aspire and become high income performers. So what we notice between 1978, which is on the left panel and 2018, which is on your right panel, is that all the countries that went past that aspirational income of 1978 US per capita income, all belong are above the tropics. They are in the temperate zone. However, we must confess that not all the countries that are in the temperate zone achieved to get into the Northeast quadrant, which is where uh, countries like Korea, Australia, uh, you know, uh, Canada, et cetera, are. So if you can, if you see this bunch, this is where the uh, high performing in, in, economies are currently. And at that time, there was only one economy, which is Saudi Arabia, which is based oil-based economy and therefore doesn't naturally match most of the other economies in this group, which is an outlier and we leave it out of the larger discussion. Okay, so in the context of climate change, uh, temperatures are a, are a big point of discussion. And we asked ourselves the question that, how do maximum temperatures look like when we plot it against per capita incomes? And, um, this is what it looks like, the transition of the 40 years of between 78 and, uh, and 2018, uh, except for the fact that most of these countries that you see belong to the point which are below the, the, the line of best fit, which is not a great line of best fit by most regression analyses, but uh, to whatever it indicates, there is no country. The takeaway from here is that there's no country in this group right now that has a, a maximum temperature above 30 degrees. So if you if you are a high, uh, you know, temperature country, like if you belong to the, if it if you are an equatorial country, you have things to worry about on that front because the last 40 years show that none of these have made it into that aspirational group. Uh, what about urbanization? One of the dramatic things that have happened over, over the last 40 years is the growth of uh, urban populations and uh, the, the, the population demographic transition that has happened of movement of people from villages to cities is uh, exhibited here. The, the additional line that you see here, which is the horizontal green line parallel to the x-axis, it divides, uh, you know, it's a 50% line. So if you are below 50% of your population is below, uh, it is in the rural sector. You are in this zone below the green line. If 50% of your population is above the 
is, is in urban sectors, then you're above the green line. And once again, if you notice that all the countries that go past the aspirational income indicated by the, the blue dotted line all have very high urban populations. Again, caveat, just because your population is going urban doesn't make you a rich country. And that's part of the crisis of uh, you know, developmental challenge. And it's gonna be point of a crisis that countries will have to deal with. We'll, we'll discuss it a little more as we go along. If you look at the mega cities of the world, which is basically 10 million plus, um, these all these belong to you know, different groups of uh, countries that we talk about. In the, amongst the high income countries, there are just five cities. In the upper mid is a large group of uh, 12, 12 of these cities and the rest all belong to the lower middle group. India and China top these with six mega cities. Uh, followed by uh, in the low middle, we have two from Pakistan. In the upper mid, we have two from Brazil. The worrying part of this would be that um, these are countries that are not, you know, rich with infrastructure. There are challenges of urban uh, drainage, water, uh, housing, and access to health. And uh, climate change is going to already, you know, uh, impact on these cities and uh, any of the developmental challenges that exist here will only get exacerbated. Uh, so how do you envisage that these countries move forward? And uh, the way that one, one could think about is to look at how countries that have achieved a higher income have gone about doing it. So we look at the three sectors. The first one is agriculture. The, the blue line, as you see, vertically dividing the uh, the aspirational income, uh, US lying in the 1978 borderline. And then you have a bunch of countries again here who have gone past that. Um, the green line that you see here is the average of all the countries in terms of their share of agricultural uh, income in terms of GDP. So these countries which are out here are the ones that have made the transition and moved into that segment out there. And if you look at the the industrial transition that has taken place is, is also quite interesting because um, these countries out here have all made the transition to the above aspirational zone on the right of the blue dotted line. And, uh, and, and if you see these big bubbles out here, which are the India and China, uh, the big population countries, which are also moving to the right, indicating a higher income, but they are both above the average of the share of industrial income coming from GDP of all these countries. So this transition is something that is, um, is a likely way for countries that are conventionally challenged with uh, multiple developmental challenges, may be able to overcome their, uh, their crises and, uh, and hopefully you know, tackle issues of climate change, which they are all going to face because they belong to countries where the hotspots of uh, climate change are attributed. In terms of the services, uh, this is, of course, you know, the post-industrial society where we're looking at a much larger share of uh, services in all these countries. And each one of these countries has a above average share in services, those who have uh, gone past the aspirational income. Again, uh, caveat that not all those countries that have high share of services have gone past that income level. And of course, again, Saudi Arabia is an outlier because of its uh, oil economy uh, based uh, incomes. If you look at climate proofing, what are the kind of uh, trajectories that we are looking at? You know, it's just when we think of industrial and structural transition, we are not looking at the conventional way of industrializing. The way to look forward would be to look at investments in green sectors, expanded irrigation networks to increase agricultural productivity. Our uh, industrial sector has to get into low emission strategies. And in the energy sector, we have to move from non-fossil fuels into, uh, um, you know, from fossil fuels to non-fossil fuels. Uh, these might be nuclear, these might be solar, these might be hydrogen uh, or CNG related, but 
basically it has to be a move wave that are um, more environment friendly. Um, what does the role, uh, what, what role does fiscal policy play here? And if you look at again, these four uh, groups of countries that we have, we, we notice that you know, the, the role that public investment plays in high income countries is much, much, much more than that is played by in any of the other segments, especially the low and lower middle income. And so it, it is an expectation that if market forces do not allow uh, higher investments in these countries, and uh, Terry's projection is in some of these countries that is unlikely to happen, the state will have to step in. And uh, if, you, if you look at this transition matrix again, it is these countries that have a very high gross capital formation that are making that um, you know, pathway onto a higher income. And uh, if you look at government spending on goods and services again, we notice that it is the uh, group of high income countries that are spending much more than the ones which are in lower mid and low income groups. Um, this particular uh, level is an outlier and uh, it's, it's a representative of just, just two countries for that particular year. It, it might be a um, aberration for that year, but effectively, if you look at across the, the group of countries, uh, it is the high income countries that are exhibiting a much higher consumption of government expenditure spending than the lower and lower mid. And so if these countries are, are aspiring to climate proof themselves, uh, they have to look at a higher percent of uh, government expenditure on goods and services. Um, this is again that uh, transition matrix graphically displayed. You've noticed that there's a huge move from this lower segment onto much higher expenditures. And yet the ones that are making that transition are uh, also uh, you know, spending a lot more in terms of their GDP from the government kitty. The ex exception out there is the US and uh, the COVID um, period has shown us the differences in terms of uh, health outcomes in countries which are in Europe have a, uh, have a larger government consumption expenditure in the health sector than in the US. And uh, that's been a talking point on, on many issues uh, in terms so where, where are we in terms of, I'm about to finish. Uh, I know that uh, I'm on a timer. Uh, there are economic targets, there are developmental challenges, there, there's challenges of urban development and of course the environment. And what are the things that one would be looking for as a package from our policymakers? Uh, we would be looking at uh, protection of rural incomes, uh, guaranteed employment for, for the marginal groups who are urban migrants. Uh, many of them are called uh, Know, climate migrants because they're moved from segments where either there are droughts or there are floods and therefore their incomes have been affected. There are existing development challenges of healthcare access, social security, food security, and gender equity. In terms of urban, uh, you know, more than 50% of our population already lives in urban spaces. It's going to go up significantly in the next 20, 30 years. And therefore, urban infrastructure in terms of housing, water, air quality, will all play a very big role. And uh, because of the increased incidence of uh, uh, you know, uh, extreme events of floods and uh, drainage will be a very, very significant uh, infrastructure requirement in addition to transport. And of course, we have the environmental challenge of preservation of our natural capital, including biodiversity, because if we do not uh, you know, uh, take that seriously, we do know that climate change will have fast, far worse effects than, than we anticipate right now. Um, what is the macroeconomic setting in which the uh, developing and low income countries are working with? Well, um, there's multiple, and this is just a sampling of what we have. Uh, we have, as, as economies open up to trade because they are, uh, you know, they're trying to increase their exports. They uh, expose themselves to the vulnerability of uh, exchange rates and uh, volatility of uh, international transfers. This reduces their domestic fiscal space and autonomy. And in terms of structural adjustments that they make, this reduces their social structure and infrastructure spending. And that automatically reduces their ability to spend on adaptation for climate change. It also leads to dismantling of labor laws and there's an increase in the informal production of the system. 
um, that has adverse impacts on social security, increases the vulnerability of the poor and leads to social instability. And so in order to counter this, there has to be an alternate way of that we design our macroeconomic policies. And that's that will be the challenge that we will face uh, with climate change. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, uh, Pranav. Very, very interesting indeed. Um, and I, I must say, um, as, um, as I noticed before, your paper is available on the website, but you haven't reached it far more uh, from uh, in your presentation, which is uh, very helpful. Uh, we'll come back to um, questions uh, later on. Now we give the floor to Alemayo Ojeda from Ethiopia, who has written three papers on three different countries, and I don't know how it's going to do to summarize three papers in 15 minutes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Alex. Let me let me share with you. It's difficult, as you say, but I'm tired. <laughs> Just hmm. the main issues. Uh, good. Good. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, nice to see you, everybody, and uh, thanks for the excellent uh, presentation uh, of both Terry uh, and Pranav. Pranav. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to navigate this thing. I hope I will manage. Good. Good. No. Give me one minute. I think now you can see me, yeah? Good. Uh, so the, the presentation, my presentation is made based on country studies uh, that have fairly different structure so that it will give us a, a continental picture. So we pick Ethiopia, a very big uh, country in terms of population, about 120 million, uh, where employment is dominated by agriculture less urbanized, only 20% of uh, the population is uh, in urban areas, de dependent on agricultural exporters. Kenya, and a, uh, a fairly diversified economy with diversified exporters, uh, well-developed uh, financial sector. Uh, and the third is Zambia, a mineral dependent economy where copper accounts over 70% of uh, the exporters and copper determines major macroeconomic outcomes, uh, relatively small size in terms of population, about 14 million, yet were uh, highly urbanized, about 44% of the population in urban areas. So at this, you know, three case studies pretty much cover, uh, you know, the, the 50 plus uh, uh, countries uh, in the continent, <clears throat> uh, probably except in North Africa. Now, <clears throat> Uh, Alemayo, forgive me, just a, a question. Some, um, some participants are asking if you could put it on a slideshow so you can see them. If you click under your screen, a slideshow. Yeah. Isn't that slideshow? So that, yeah, because then you can see the, the slides uh, bigger. If you can, otherwise just yeah, carry on. Let me, let me try it. Does it, okay. Does it look like I'm, uh, I'm getting it? Yeah, you're, you're getting it stuck. It just yeah. doesn't much continue as you are. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now with these features, uh, I looked at generally, uh, tried to summarize, uh, you know, those uh, papers into three categories. What is what was you know the effect of the COVID on macro and growth condition? So pretty much this complement Terry's presentation. And uh, I have looked also what will be this, the social and economic effect uh, generally, and what was the response of both the private sector and you know, the public sector. Uh, uh, and then what are the recovery challenges? So this pretty much I summarized them in these three. Now, in all the three cases, you know, gross decelerated significantly, uh, in tandem with the, the continental trade. You know, have an African GDP growth has decelerated by two by two percent in 2020. 
and it's projected to grow by 3.4% according to African Development Bank. Uh, and the East African region where these three countries uh, are, uh, uh, they actually decline more than the continental average by 3%. But it's expected that it will recover to 3%. So as you, as you can see from the little graph there, there's huge deceleration of growth uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa over the last uh, 10 years. From Sorry, average, give me, Alimayo, we, 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 we get the, the frozen screen in front of us. Could you, um, could you move perhaps to the slide you are talking about? Um, if yeah, you... um, I already, in my, in my uh, laptop, I already moved. Yeah, Can it doesn't see? seem to be here. No. You can't you can't move to a new slide up there. Oh, the, really? Yeah. Can you move to a new slide? No, okay. I think you, you may need to reload it again and press okay. F5 from the beginning. Otherwise, we don't see your graphs. Yeah. Okay, let me let me let me do it Uh, I thought you already got this with. Can you see now? Yeah, yeah. perfect, perfect, Let's yeah. See. Yes, now you can scroll down. That's they, they perfect. It, yes, yeah, it. that's that's exactly it. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the continent. Hmm. Well, in twenty twenty, uh, a two person. Uh, decline, but the East African region where we is decline, declining trend. On Hello, everyone. Uh, Forgive me, Alemayo, again. And, uh, and, uh, Forgive me, Alemayo. We are having some bandwidth problem, I think, uh, with your site. Perhaps is if everybody turns off the video oh. and the microphone, and that will give us more bandwidth for the presentation of Alemayo. Okay, so we lost Alemayo. Probably there are some uh, uh, connection problems. Can we perhaps then start with the questions and answers on the first two presentations? And, and then we try to hook up with Alemayo when he reconnects. Um, now, I'm, I have um, uh, a couple of questions to the paper of Terry. Uh, and, uh, and actually, the, the two of them that I have in front of me are, are very similar, uh, though from uh, different country examples. And, and then I have one more question of my own, which I'm going to make. Sorry, Alemayo. Um, um, Alemayo? Yes. I'm, I'm explaining that we lost you for a moment. Yeah. So we're going to use this uh, next uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes maximum to discuss the two papers that were presented before, and then you will resume your presentation because otherwise we will not do one or the other, if that's okay with you. Good, I'm, I'm fine, go ahead. Perfect. Okay, so then um, one, one obvious question to the presentation of um, you, Terry, 
is that um, the projections you are showing is, uh, of course, it's showing a long term, uh, long term, mid, mid term uh, kind of average for the different countries and regions and growth average and deficits and current account deficits, government deficits, um, international investment positions. So there, there should be some assumptions underlying these um, projections. Uh, because they are obviously not, you know, not mechanical uh, projections. They, they, there's some uh, policy, um, structural constraints, whatever. So the obvious question is if you could uh, explain them um, briefly so that we understand why do we get these results, which in some cases are shocking. Now, the other two questions that I received myself through here, which have some relationship with each other, uh, have to do with how do you see the role of public sector deficits? For example, there is one um, question uh, with the concrete case of Bangladesh saying, you know, the deficit, the public sector deficit is not growing that much. And indeed, you see it in your slide nine. Um, then it also says that the debt is not growing, public sector debt is not growing that much. You see it in slide 11. And yet the current account deficit is growing very much. So the obvious, um, uh, the, the question is then why is it that, how do you explain that the country can have uh, shrinking or not growing public sector deficits, but current account deficits going up. So this in relationship with the um, uh, previous um, question, uh, which had to do with what are the role of public sector deficits in, in your analysis. So that's for you, Terry. Um, I have here, a question, a question on, on, on the, the uh, climate, uh, uh, climate story of Pranav. Um, this climate proofing uh, actually it seems to require um, fiscal policy, basically, if we understood it well. And uh, the question that came to me is that, uh, you know, um, how, how can developing countries implement more fiscal policy if uh, you know, the, you need uh, you need some some space to do that, and, and countries in the in the south are not generally having a lot of space for implementing fiscal policy, like countries in the in the in the north, which actually have the ability to print money, buy government bonds, etc. Right, and uh, and then um, uh, I would add to that question something of my own, <laughs> for you to be a bit provocative. Um, would that imply that um, for um, uh, countries in the south to be able to do this climate proofing, these mitigation efforts, they have to have more leeway in terms of fiscal, fiscal policy, so they, they should be allowed to, to spend more. Okay, so this, um, um, perhaps you tariff first on the general assumptions on the model and secondly, on the role of uh, fiscal deficits and what relation there might be with uh, between fiscal deficits and current account deficits with the complete case of Bangladesh, if you want. And then we go to Pranav. Terry, okay. it's over to you. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, once people get the paper, which is, I guess is gonna be a while, You'll see that at the beginning, you know, Francis and I, Francis especially, laid out some of the explicit assumptions uh, for the scenario based on certain assumed growth rates of real GDP, uh, changes in the energy variables, for example, 2019, 2025, 2030, certain assumptions about sources of external income, whether they grow or not, and uh, trends in savings and investments. So there were certain overriding assumptions that were made, uh, even on the People's Republic of China, where we made certain assumptions that we thought would make sense. And that those are sort of the, the assumptions underlying the model, other than the, the workings of the model itself in terms of the projections it's, it's producing. So I think you'll be able to see that once the, the paper is out. The second question was between the public sector deficits and the current account deficits, is that right? 
Yeah, the concrete question the concrete question was raising the, the case of Bangladesh, in which um, the, there is not so much of a growth of the uh, public sector deficit, but there is a, a fast growth of the current account deficit. So how is it possible? The more general question had to do with what are the roles of public sector deficits in, uh, say, allowing or not allowing economic growth? Well, I mean, generally, I mean, depending on the nature of the public sector deficit, what's being spent, what is the deficit being spent on in terms of what are, whether it would generate growth or not would be the big question. What is the nature of the public investment, for example, that's being financed as part of that? Would that generate more growth or, or not? So I, I don't see, I guess there's certain assumption there about uh, some linear relationship between the public sector deficit and the current account deficit, but it's a, a more variable in terms of the kind of policies you're going to institute. If you're just talking about, you know, financing current account, you're, you have a current account, uh, excuse me, a public sector deficit based on, you know, uh, supporting current consumption, that's not going to have a growth impact. I don't know. I, I'm not sure, not sure what the question is, but I'm trying to respond to this as far as I know. Terry, forgive me, the relationship between the current account deficit and the government deficit, the case of Bangladesh, where the current account deficit is growing, but not the government deficit? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I won't necessarily be able to tell you specifically on individual countries. Mm. Okay, but I guess uh, in any case, the, when there is a current account deficit growing and not a government deficit growing, what seems to be happening is that the private sector deficit might be therefore uh, rising uh, far faster and that may trigger the current account deficit. Okay, Pranav, um, over to you then. Uh, thank you, Alex, for that question. And uh, it's, a, it's a question that keeps coming up as to what should developing countries do to get some autonomy. And there have been multiple responses to this. One is uh, the extreme case where you're dealing from the world economy and you try and build your own domestic space. Uh, one of the advantages that um, countries that have a lower exposure to international trade and capital movements is that they have that space and therefore are not driven by the needs for international capital who are uh, you know, trying to uh, impose their needs on the, on the public policy making. Um, one of the... There are two possible options. One is that where, um, or maybe more than two options. One is where developing development organizations and multilateral agencies provide windows of support to developing countries, you know, in addition to the international finance that they have to borrow from the market. And if, if that can provide them the cushion to, you know, increase their, um, you know, adaptation measure expenditures. The other option is, uh, you know, is, is, is difficult and it's it's hard politically to do is to do capital controls and uh, all kinds of uh, hell breaks loose if, if uh, you know, this is not in, uh, in in tandem with what other countries are doing. And therefore, there is a role that for countries of similar nature form regional groupings and have regional cooperation where they can build a larger, you know, regional market and in some ways uh, provide cushion to each other in terms of uh, trade space, um, internal borrowing, et cetera. So uh, there are multiple ways in which that physical space can be created. Uh, it's hard, it, it takes a lot of negotiation and, um, and it, it obviously needs a lot of political courage uh, to do. And uh, given that you know we are in a world where we are, where, um, so many of the existing cooperation uh, networks are breaking down. One hopes that new ones will emerge and uh, developing uh, countries will have access to organizations that uh, the multilateral agencies without conditionalities uh, to help them build their own domestic, you know, uh, reach, the, reach out to the do domestic needs in, in a much more uh, significant way. Mm. I don't know, Alex, if I've uh, responded to you uh, Yes, I, I, to me, yes. And I think that the other person who asked a similar question, which I um, 
topped over. Uh, I think they will be very satisfied with that type of answer, though obviously it's a challenge. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, there is one quick question here uh, by another participant on Russian growth, and um, basically is saying why is it that Russia is growing so badly in the in the future, and that's before the 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 conflict in Ukraine. Um, um, I don't know if you could quickly answer that, Terry. Um, otherwise, I, I, I have the paper in my hand. I have some idea as well. Go over uh, you, Terry, first, if you mind. Yeah, I mean, I noticed that myself, that uh, it was having problems even without assuming, you know, uh, uh, I think some of the assumptions have to do with uh, the international situation, the, the assumptions on, in terms of energy variables and so forth that we made in our table two in, in, the, in the paper. But, you know, without going into the details of, of Russia itself, I don't think I could give a good answer. Yeah, thank you, Terry. That's right. So very quickly, indeed, there is a very strong assumption in the, in the construct of the model by which there is um, some uh, considerable efforts, though not sufficient to reach the targets, but considerable efforts, nevertheless, in shifting uh, energy uh, towards uh, non-fossil fuels, and that uh, obviously hits many of the oil and gas exporters in the in the midterm. Okay, so now let's hope that Alemayo has a better bandwidth. And um, uh, Alemayo, I'm going to give it over to you. Um, and uh, if we have the same problem, uh, and if you lost the connection, then um, I think that at least you should try without the presentation, but because that's perhaps what's taking a, a bit of the bandwidth there. Alemayo, it's over to you now. Yeah, can you see it? Can you see it? I'm sharing now. No, I, we don't see the presentation. I think you had to talk over because um, it is black on our screen at this moment. Um, it, it's better if you use your time uh, talking over your main points, Alemaya. I'm, I'm sorry we're having this trouble. Good, good. Okay, now I'll, I'll do that. Uh, uh, I'm sorry about that. Okay. Uh, no, uh, basically, what, I, what, uh, what we have. What I have tried to see is these three countries, and in three of the countries, uh, first, the generally grows significantly decelerated, uh, comparable to the continental average. Say in Ethiopia, uh, uh, we, uh, we, a lot of people say that the, the COVID effects almost uh, led to zero growth, although the government claims about that. But in, in the other case, like in Kenya, uh, uh, it's almost zero, comparatively better, but in Zambia uh, is about uh, negative uh, 3%. Uh, and the reason uh, uh, for, for this is mainly, but the most important uh, uh, factor is that uh, the, both the government and the private sector uh, doesn't have you know, the capacity to, to withstand the shock despite you know, various efforts. Now, in case of Zambia, uh, in case of Zambia, fortunately, uh, fortunately, the copper price has uh, increased dramatically during this period. And that helped uh, a lot. Otherwise, it would have been much more uh, worse uh, than this one. So in these studies, uh, then we have also examined how, how uh, the private sector is, uh, responded and also what was the response of the government was it was it was it helpful uh, to to the private sector um, and the households now in in three of the countries the conclusion from you know the three countries one the effect of the pandemic on the private sector uh, and their response uh, uh, shows uh, that for all studies generally all firms suffered but the brunt of uh, the cost of the pandemic has fallen on small and micro firms who severely affected by the pandemic than larger and medium-sized firms. Second, the pandemic is 
disproportionately affecting businesses with large share of female employees. Uh, for instance, uh, the number of uh, food insecure uh, MSEs households uh, in Kenya jumped from 40% before the pandemic to uh, 61%, which is a dramatic increase. Uh, the majority, on the other hand, the majority of you know, people in the agriculture and the manufacturing firms have been able to remain open, so relatively uh, they are better. So service sector and within the service sector, uh, those who have strongly KU, the global economy, suffered in, in all the, uh, the three countries. So in all the countries, uh, uh, we, we try to see the effect on also the poverty. And in all of the three countries, uh, poverty effect of the pandemic was severe. Uh, and uh, has, poverty has increased in all, in all countries. For instance, if you take in, Jam in Zambia, before COVID-19, the headcount ratio was uh, 54, and that has jumped to 53 to, to 56 percent uh, after uh, the pandemic, according to uh, our estimates. Now, having this general, you know, gross deceleration and uh, worst uh, social uh, social economic effect in terms of poverty, food insecurity, and we had have you, which which should be understandable because. You know, this in these countries, the informal sector sector is very huge, minimum forty percent uh, in these countries. Uh, therefore, the, the COVID basically uh, is a challenge in terms of livelihood. You have one has to make a decision whether during that time whether to go to work uh, and get some food uh, versus you know be uh, uh, be locked down and get get hungry. So. That, that, was, that was a dilemma at the end, but in most of the countries, uh, the, the choice was uh, you know, uh, to avoid to some degree the knockdown quickly. So as a result, you know, this people suffered. Now, what was in all countries having this effect, in all countries, we, we have the following major uh, macro and fiscal feature, which can fairly be generalized to the continent in terms of uh, government physical uh, posture and the recovery challenges. One, they all had been ridden by fiscal challenges before the pandemic. Uh, in Kenya, in Ethiopia, and in Zambia, uh, uh, there was huge debt. There was structural uh, trade deficit. Uh, inflation was in particular in Zambia and Ethiopia was very high. So before the pandemic, they had very weak macroeconomic uh, picture. Then when the shock comes, it, it aggravated all these macroeconomic uh, bad uh, conditions. Macroeconomic instability persisted uh, even up, up until now, especially in Zambia and Ethiopia, budget deficit, balance of payment deficit, inflation remained. So the inability of that, we also witnessed, witnessed the inability of domestic demand stimulus uh, as, a for, as a base for recovery as that of uh, uh, the global north uh, because of structural, structural problems uh, in these economies. So this basically then uh, takes me to, to the final point, the need and importance of uh, 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 external finance. Because in all of these countries, what we have what witnessed is the COVID effect is to reduce government revenue, to increase government expenditure, and increase indebtedness. Now, uh, therefore, is it the question is, uh, can we have sustainable uh, recovery with this precarious macroeconomic condition and the effect of the COVID? And unless you know external, some kind of external resources are can, uh, are forthcoming, it will be it will be a challenge. For instance, uh, uh, in twenty twenty one. Uh, the African Economic Report of the African Development Bank uh, says that since the COVID-19 pandemic begins in early 2020, governments have announced physical stimulus packages ranging in terms of cost from about 0.02% of the GDP in South Sudan to about 10% of GDP in South Africa. 
So the bank estimates that African governments need additional gross financing of about 154 billion in 2021 to respond to the crisis. Now, the, but as I told you earlier, the, you know, the countries are not in a shape to raise all this fund. So what will be, as a conclusion then, what will be the challenge of recovery? I'm, I'm left with one slide, Alex. What, as a conclusion, what will be the challenge of recovery? It will be enormous. It's probably uh, it, the pandemic effect underlines uh, the following things. One, the importance of external assistance to have a sustained uh, recovery in the short term. And the second, the importance of a global recovery, in particular, uh, uh, commodity prices, uh, as a result, commodity prices for uh, African sustainable recovery. Third, the importance of diversification in inter Africa trade, uh, uh, you know, as part of this recovery, because relatively speaking, Kenya, which is more diversified, which is selling a lot in the continent perform better, better than the others. So diversification uh, uh, and inter africa trade could contribute a lot for this. Third, a, co a focus on food security, uh, agriculture, and designing a social protection uh, for the poor and the, vul the vulnerable uh, should be also an agenda, a policy agenda for African uh, governments. Thank you very much, Alex. <clears throat> Thanks, thanks so much, Alemayo. Your presentation was very clear, even without the slides. Amazing. Um, you may need to close your sharing screen because otherwise we will not be able to see anything else. That's right. Perfect. Thanks. Um, okay, so we will have only one question to you, Alemayo, because um, we are running out of time, and after after me, it's going to be um, wrapping up. Um, uh, Joe Micho, who uh, is very knowledgeable of this work, for years have been a collaborator with the Global Policy Model. So um, one question to you, um, Alemayo, is that you, you mentioned the, the need of um, uh, resolving the problem of external resources, which is a problem that comes even before the pandemic. Um, so with that, you mean uh, basically financing, but also trade access in the sense that, you know, when you said commodity prices, stabilization of commodity prices, um, diversification, that basically you are asking for, for, for two things as a kind of uh, part of the policy package. One is um, some, some uh, you know, resource aid or whatever, financing for development. Uh, but the other is to allow um, African countries to enter into the global scene to earn their own revenues, basically. Is that right? Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> Well, that was a quick answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, yeah, like, I mean, uh, I can explain it a little bit if you want to. But what happened is like, if you see, you know, the, the African growth, African mm -hmm. growth between 2002 and 2013 is one of the spectacular growth that we never had for the last 100 years. And the fundamental reason for this was for the first time in 100 years, the terms of trade was in favor of us. You know, before 2002, the terms of trade for the last 100 years have been deteriorating at 0.8% per annum. Now, since 2002, up until 2013, uh, we had a positive terms of trade for the first time. As a result, on the average, the African country... Uh, Alemayo, we, we, we seem to have lost you, but I think your, your answer was very persuasive already, so we have to leave it at that. I'm um, afraid we are going to um, move uh, quickly to Joe Mitchell. We started a bit later, so we have some five, ten extra minutes of leeway. Uh, before I'm giving the, the, the floor to Joe, uh, two things to note very quickly from my end. One is that please, after the seminar is, uh, is finished, you will get uh, bump into a new screen to answer a survey, of a very, very quick survey. So please do so, because that's going to be very helpful to us. And secondly, just to note that despite the fact that all this effort done over two years haven't um, taken into account and the, 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 the conflict in, in, in Ukraine, 
um, it does show um, uh, a very, in a very clear way uh, the main challenges ahead for developing uh, countries. And then furthermore, the, the trade and development report um, produced in, 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 in UNTAC, in, in our team, uh, is going to release next week, exactly next week uh, from now, a short-term report which takes into account more specifics of the conflict in Ukraine. So I hope you will uh, stay tuned with us to follow that uh, in the next um, week, therefore. Joe, it's over to you and thanks very much for taking over. Thanks, Alex, and thanks ever so much to all of the speakers in the session today for their uh, insightful and detailed uh, presentations. Uh, I think it's very clear the scale of the challenges facing uh, lower income countries uh, as a result of limited external policy space. Alameo's presentation was very clear in showing the external constraints, um, some would say imposed on many countries by the countries of the, the global north. Um, Pranab's presentation, I think, presented some very insightful cross-sectional uh, information showing the, the trajectories that countries go through and again, emphasizing both sort of fundamental constraints and more importantly, imposed policy constraints um, and highlighting the political difficulties and tensions in overcoming those, those constraints. And finally, Terry's presentation, rather than focusing on, 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 the, on the interesting case, uh, as we saw with Alamayo and the cross-section of countries, with Pranab, we got the full panel analysis of the whole world for the next 10 years. And of course, as, as we zoom out, we have to take a sort of bigger picture and a slightly less detailed fine grained uh, analysis, but some very sobering projections. I for one would be very happy to spend longer asking questions. I, I would be fascinated to understand the assumptions that were put into the, the modeling exercise to understand the, the sort of profound divergence and the underdevelopment trends, particularly the trends in Africa, which were uh, extremely alarming if, um, for example, the projections for Nigeria were to come to pass, they would be extremely um, alarming. But unfortunately, we have two minutes left, so we'll have to wait for the paper to find out what is driving the projections and therefore what can be done in terms of policy to prevent the outcomes suggested. Um, so I thank the uh, presenters one more time and given that we have one minute or so until the end of the, the, the panel I think all that is left to do is to um, ask people to move to the, the next session I don't know exactly where it is but Alex there is somewhere that people must go to to complete a, a survey is that right can you give us the details um, well, the way I understand it, you know, um, uh, as soon as you, the, the meeting is over, you will be faced with the survey before actually closing everything. So then if you stay on the survey and, 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 and go through it very quickly, it will take less than, than one minute. So thanks very much, uh, Joe. Thanks uh, to all of you, Francis, Pranav, um, Alemayo, um, and Terry. And, uh, and also thanks to the colleagues here who have taken the burden of uh, uh, making sure that this project resists the administrative bunkers <laughs> um, uh, the, of all kinds of offices and regulations and paperwork and etc. Nock Nguyen and Penelope Hawkins were incredibly helpful. Apart from uh, being the inspiration of the overall project, they, they took hold of all the, this work. So thanks very much to them as well. And we hope to stay tuned. OK, thanks. Bye bye then. So everybody, some. So I suppose you leave the meeting and then you will get a question. Is that right? The survey? Yeah, yeah. that's what is happening, so. Okay, okay. So we should leave the question, the, 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 the meeting then. Thanks very much again, bye-bye. Bye, good night, everyone, bye.